Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here, Jacob. Jacob, for everyone out there listening, please let everyone know a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, it's nice to be here, Robbie. I'm Jacob Hornberger. I'm president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is a nonprofit educational foundation that I founded some 32 years ago. And our mission at FFF is to present the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And in that context, we address the burning issues of the day, both domestic issues, foreign policy issues. And um, I've addressed many, many times in the course of FF's history, what we're going to be talking about today, and that's the national security establishment, national security state form of governmental structure we have that we've all been born and raised under, and its assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Okay, so the assassination of John F. Kennedy, I would probably call myself a libertarian more like now I'm probably politically homeless, because I started to realize how much politics has been leaked into everything. And the one thing that I've always been about is like just anti corruption, I think both sides can really deal with that as well, too. Um, and then when I started reaching out to people to talk about the JFK assassination, because it's just an interesting topic, it's something that's, it's literally like how 911 is for a lot of people, it's this mysterious thing, we don't have all the answers to and whether that answer are leaked out to us it has just became one that i've been trying to understand more and more about and when i've talked to a lot of people about this topic i'm curious because you've written two books and then now a new third one as well too um that kind of relates back to the jfk thing as well what about the jfk assassination and a lot of like the national security issues do you really see well, you know, one of the common questions I get is, Jacob, why do you spend time on this? I've, I've got two books called The Kennedy Autopsy, which is FFF's all-time best-selling book, and then uh, The Kennedy Autopsy 2, which is a supplement to that. I've got a book called Regime Change, the JFK Assassination, uh, The Evil of the National Security State, and then my newest book, which I consider the best of all of them, is called An Encounter with Evil, the Abraham Zabruder story. We've also published a book by Douglas Horn, who served on the Assassination Records Review Board in the 1990s called JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, Why Kennedy Was Assassinated. We've got a couple of books by Jefferson Morley, former reporter from the Washington Post on the Kennedy assassination. So I'm asked, wh why, do you, why do you spend so much time here? What's the relevance? Well, there's a direct relevance. This is, this is what a lot of people don't realize. I mean, look around at the kind of society in which we live. I mean, constant crises with respect to especially foreign affairs. The, the newest one is Ukraine. But before Ukraine, there was Afghanistan, Iraq, and 9-11. And, and they go on and on. It goes all the way back to the end of World War II with the Cold War and Korean War and Vietnam War, where they killed 58,000 of my generation. And then the war on terrorism. All of this bears a direct relationship to what happened in November 1963, which we can delve into. But that was a rupture point in, in American history. And it bears a direct relationship to where we are today because the fact is that Kennedy was committed to moving this country in a totally different direction from the direction that the Pentagon and the CIA, the National Security Establishment, were committed to moving America. And it was that conflict of visions that set forth the war that, that Douglas Horn explains in his book that I mentioned earlier, uh, the war that ended up with Kennedy losing. And we, we moved back onto this trajectory of this huge anti-communist animus, anti-Russia animus that, that drove the entire Cold War and that continued driving it even after the ostensible end of the Cold War. We can see that that animus continued, continued it continues to this day. And what I'm suggesting as a libertarian and what we do at FFF is that to say there's a way out of this morass, that we don't have to live lives like this, Robbie, with constant chaos and crises and now 
We're closer to the prospect of a nuclear war than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And understanding the Kennedy assassination and the Kennedy administration and what he was trying to do and why he was assassinated points the direction on what we need to do to get out of this morass. Okay, so with the Kennedy assassination, can you walk me through what you would relate it to that could point us out of this situation that we're in now? Because, I mean, from just hearing you explain all that and kind of my own understanding of everything, I've always mentioned like the aspect of cleaning house. And I've heard Oliver Stone mention that as well, too, with the JFK thing and the administration that he never cleaned house when he took office. Um, a lot of the situations that were in people say, well, it's a Democrat or it's a Republican. It's always these two options. And I'm just like, I think it's something deeper than that, because every time we see this flop around between a Democrat getting in office and then a Republican getting in office, it's the same issues that we're still dealing with. There might be new problems and some things get fixed, but it's the same core principles that it seems like we're not really paying attention to. I say like Illuminati stuff, but people go, there's nobody in cloaks. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about we've let something deeper in the works of a machine set a system in place, whether that's business, whether that's whatever, that has its own motivations on the front. And um, maybe I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I, I think we're not we're not paying attention because the same things keep repeating. And I think the best tracker for this is looking at history. And there's clear examples of issues and problems that are still going on today that we could be fixing, but we're not looking back at the roots because it gets linked into conspiracy, it gets linked into this. And I think that's a really big issue. Absolutely. And it does go much deeper. What we really had was a conflict of visions that Kennedy wants to move America in one direction the national security establishment, which I consider a fourth branch of government, very powerful, consistent of the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA, is absolutely committed to moving America in a different direction. That's what this ultimately is all about. And they're two diametrically opposing visions. Here's what happens. And the, the best explanation of this is Douglas Horn's book, JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, Why Kennedy Was Assassinated, and then my new book, An Encounter with Evil, where I go extensively into this. What we're really talking about is motive. Kennedy comes into office as pretty much a standard Cold Warrior. Now, what does that mean? Well, at the end of World War II, after the, the Nazi regime had been defeated, U.S. officials told the American people, Look, you know, you've done, you've had a great achievement here. We've defeated the Nazis, but unfortunately, you can't rest. We can't rest. We're now facing a, a more implacable, more dangerous foe than Nazism, and that's communism. And it's represented by the Soviet Union. There's an international communist conspiracy. It's based in Moscow. They are committed to burying us, to taking us over. And that's when the federal government gets converted from the founding governmental system of a limited government republic to what we call a national security state. A limited government republic has three branches of government, a very basic, uh, relatively small military force, uh, no omnipotent powers. A national security state has omnipotent powers, powers of assassination, powers of indefinite detention, kidnapping, torture, Guantanamo. And the argument was, we need these powers if we're going to prevent this communist takeover. So we get Korea, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Kennedy comes in pretty much as a standard Cold Warrior. Everybody was at that time, with one exception. Kennedy sympathized with third world independence movements, like with Patrice Lumumba in the, in the Congo. The, the Pentagon and the CIA's position was, no, these are communist driven. Uh, and, and they need to be dealt with, including through assassination. So just before Kennedy comes into office, they orchestrate the assassination of Lumumba. Here was a guy who was totally innocent. All he did was lead this independence movement in the Congo, and that justified his assassination. Well, they, they, they did it right before Kennedy took office because they knew Kennedy wouldn't approve because Kennedy's position was, no, these are people trying to throw off the shackles of colonial rule. But other than that, Kennedy's pretty much a standard Cold Warrior. So when the CIA comes and says, look, we want to invade Cuba. Now, here's an independent country, a, a, a totally independent country, has never attacked the United States. And the CIA is telling this new president, Kennedy, we need to invade the country to oust this communist regime because they're a threat to America. And so Kennedy goes along with this. And that's what the famous Bay of Pigs invasion was about. It was a proxy invasion. They were using Cuban exiles as a proxy, but clearly it was a CIA operation. 
but they lied to Kennedy. They said, we won't need any kind of U.S. air support. We won't need an invasion. We can pull this off. The Cuban people are going to have this massive uprising and they're going to help us oust Castro. Well, it was a lie and they knew it was a lie, but they figured they would manipulate this neophyte president into once the invasion starts to falter and the communists are killing these brave Cuban exiles, he would have to provide the air support and the and possibly the invasion. Well, they didn't read this guy well. And Kennedy said, no, when that point came and they said, we need the air support, they're, they're getting killed. Kennedy said no. And that began the war between the CIA and Kennedy. The, the, the invasion goes down to defeat. A thousand guys plus are, are killed or captured. The CIA is livid. This is a neophyte president who has shown cowardice in the face of, of a fight with the communists. The communists have, have killed or captured all these brave Cuban exiles that were friends of the CIA. Kennedy, for his part, is livid as well. He knows he's been played. He knows he's been manipulated. He is reputed to have said, I'm going to tear the, the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And that was his mindset. He was going to destroy the CIA. He fires Alan Dulles, the much revered uh, director of the CIA, plus his two chief deputies. Uh, so now the war is on between Kennedy and the CIA. In the meantime, the Pentagon is starting to tell Kennedy, you can't leave Cuba there in communist hands. They're pressuring him to invade. Just like you know, the, the Russians have invaded Ukraine. That's why we have parallels here. The Pentagon and the CIA at this point say, you need to invade this sovereign country. And Kennedy is saying, no, no. And they come up with this Operation Northwoods, which they kept secret for 30 years until the Assassination Records Review Board uncovered it, which called for, for fraudulent terrorist attacks on American soil that would kill real Americans as a pretext to invade Cuba. They were gonna, they were gonna be committed by Pentagon agents posing as communists. Kennedy rejects Operation Northwoods. Then the Cuban Missile Crisis comes. And here the Soviets are installing nuclear missiles in Cuba, which they had every right to do. It's a sovereign country. Cuba is a sovereign country, just like they're saying with Ukraine right now. It has a right to join NATO. Uh, but you, the U.S. took the same position as, as the Russians are taking with respect to Ukraine today. You will not put nuclear missiles 90 miles away from American shores pointing at American cities. And so they, Kennedy finally strikes a deal with the Soviets and says, all right, I will never let the, the Pentagon and the CIA invade Cuba again. Permanent. That's it. And oh, by the way, we will also re remove our nuclear missiles pointed at you in Turkey. Well, at this point, the, the Pentagon and the CIA are furious, livid. I mean, one uh, joint a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff called it the biggest defeat in U.S. history. He compared Kennedy's handling of the crisis to Neville Chamberlain's appeasement at, at Munich. So they come to the conclusion that this guy can't handle this communist threat to America and that America is going to fall to the communists because of Kennedy's appeasement. Kennedy, at this point, achieves one of the most remarkable breakthroughs in history. He realizes that this whole anti-Soviet Union, anti-communist animus is, is destroying America. And he says, I'm going to bring it to an end. And this is the conflict of visions. He goes to American University in June of 63, just a few months before he's assassinated, and says, it's, and it was an ambush, total ambush on, on, the, on the Pentagon and the CIA. He says, it's over, that we're going to have peaceful and mutual coexistence with the Soviets. And he's negotiating with Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, who's on the same page. They're making nice with each other. Let, let's put a stop to this and let's have peaceful, friendly coexistence. He praises the Soviets, if you can believe that in this speech. And he says, America is moving in a new direction now. And so he, he orders a pullout from Vietnam. He, or, he gets the nuclear test ban treaty. He even proposes a joint trip to the moon, which means sharing rocket technology. Well, th this was the gauntlet, Robbie. Th this was the conflict of visions. Because if Kennedy's vision prevails, there's no more need for a national security state. He's got one more year in office. If he's reelected, which he surely would have been because they, they, he could have easily beaten Barry Goldwater. Uh, He's got four more years in office. The likelihood is that his brother is going to run for president at that point. You don't need all this national security state. But from the perspective of the national security establishment, Kennedy poses a grave threat to national security. 
that this little neophyte naive president is leading America to defeat in the Cold War and to a communist takeover. And that's where the war gets going. It's Kennedy against the national security establishment, and it's resolved on November 22nd, 1963. Now, Operation Northwoods was when they were going to blow up an airliner and blame it on Cuba, correct? They were going to hijack an airliner, or at least make it look like airliners were going to be hijacked. I'm not sure whether they were actually going to blow one up with, with passengers. It's possible. I'm not really familiar with all the details, but I don't think that was the case. I think the people were going to die in terrorist attacks, but the, but the airliners, I don't think they were going to blow them up. I think they were going to make it look like they were being hijacked. And so are you saying like the national security was more powerful? Cause I, everyone, when we talk about like a leader, we talk about the president, but I, like I said in the beginning about just the system that's kind of messed up, you have like Watergate, the Watergate scandal and all that issues with wiretapping Americans phones and uh, William, William Colby, who stood up after just seeing like the whole system of CIA just kind of go down the drain in a sense. Um, and speak out about all the issues that are going on. I mean, is this just all these corporations that teamed up and had a bunch of power that wanted to get rid of one guy? Is that how they pull off an assassination like this? Like when you're looking at the JFK assassination, I mean, from everything you just told me, the one thing that I keep that keeps ringing in my head, I would say, which is Oswald, when um, they were talking about him hanging or uh, handing out papers, flyers, um, either was it Cuba uh, or was it just, communist flyers or something like that um saying that he was on the street like pro-communism because he lived in russia for so long and it seemed like they were trying to smear him with a bunch of stuff to make up for the fact or make him look even worse just so people could be okay with the fact that he was killed by another person um when you're talking about the assassination you're talking about how all this links into that fateful day how does how do they get away with something like that? Like, is this a whole system effort to just want to hide evidence and get rid of one person? Is it that is it that laid out like that, or is it just a, a conglomeration of stuff? Well, keep in mind you've got a war that's taking place between effectively two branches of government, and, and I, as I explain in my new book, An Encounter with Evil, uh, a, a parallel to this is what takes place in Chile ten years later. In, in Chile, you've got a democratically elected president, Salvador Allende, who's, who's a socialist, and he's making nice with the, with the Soviet Union in Cuba, just like Kennedy was. And the Chilean National Security Establishment, their version of the, the, the gigantic military intelligence establishment, goes to war against Allende. And they attempt to assassinate him with bullets and missiles, and they ended up fighting uh, a, a hard-fought battle, and, and Allende at the end of this thing is dead. Now, the thing to keep in mind in this is that when you bring a national security state in existence, remember, we start out as a limited government republic with just a relatively small basic military force. When you change that to a national security state, you are bringing into existence omnipotent government, at least omnipotent in the sense that this section of the government has omnipotent prop, uh, powers. And it arrogates to itself the power to determine whether a president is a threat to national security. I mean, suppose, for example, you, you end up with a Stalin or a Hitler that's elected president of the United States, and he starts putting together gas chambers and starts killing masses of people and so forth. Well, my hunch is that there would be a lot of people that would want the national security establishment to remove this president violently. Don't, don't wait for the election. Well, the problem is the Constitution doesn't provide for that as a way to remove a president. Here, we didn't have that. Clearly, Kennedy's no Stalin or Hitler. But if you're convinced that a president's policies are going to result in a communist takeover of the United States, where then you get a, a Castro or you get a St Stalin, then as a, as, as a protector of national security, you would feel compelled to to hell with the Constitution is not a suicide pact. We need to take over here and we need to remove this president, and we, which is what happened in Chile. They remove Allende and they, they install Pinochet. Here, they remove Kennedy. They elevate Johnson, who's on the same page as the national security establishment. All of a sudden, all of Kennedy's vision is out the window. Johnson gets the Gulf of Tonkin resolution enacted. Uh, based on these fraudulent, fraudulent non-existent attack in the in the Gulf of Tonkin in, in North Vietnam, uh, they ramp up the Vietnam War. 
the, the Cold War is back on. The, the monies are flowing into the national security establishment. And, uh, and effectively, they make the national security state a permanent feature of American life. So what you've got here is a giant, powerful part of the government. It's the most powerful part of the government. I, I highly recommend a book, and I've been recommending this book ever since it came out, by a professor called um, Michael Glennon. He, he's a professor of law at Tufts University, and he served as counsel for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So this, this guy is not a quack. And his book, National Security and Double Government's thesis is very readable. It's a scholarly book, but very readable for the average person. His thesis is a very basic one, and I, and I subscribe to it, that the, the entity that is running the federal government is the national security part of the government, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA. The other three branches, the president, the executive branch, the, the judicial branch, the congressional branch, they operate in support. But all this thing going on in, in Ukraine, NATO, and so forth, they're calling it in the Pentagon, the CIA. It's not Biden that's doing it. It's not the, not the Congress that's doing it. This is a Pentagon CIA show. And, and so that's what we have here. We have a very powerful part of the government, the most powerful part of the government that's operating. And if a president gets out of line, that president's got big problems. And, and Congressman Schumer pointed this out. When, when President Trump was campaigning for office, he made waves against the national security establishment. You're not supposed to do that when you're running for president. I mean, you're just not supposed to. And so they they went after him. Now, he ended up caving after he became president. But Congressman Schumer, in a, in a moment of great candor, says, you don't take on the national security establishment. They have six ways to Sunday to get back at you. And what he was referring to is the omnipotent power of the national security establishment. You don't jack with them as a president. And that's why every president since Kennedy has fallen into line with the CIA and the Pentagon and the NSA. That's what I was uh, mentioning. When we talk about people always want to choose a side left or right, wait till we get a Republican in there, wait till we get a Democrat in there. I go, you're missing the base point, which is every time someone like that from a different party gets into office, they have all these promises that just fade away. People go, well, they didn't stick with their promises. It's like, do you think that there isn't a reason why they don't stick with their promises? Like they get in there and they realize that there's something bigger or something else that's kind of running the system in a sense. And the president's kind of just for show. I mean, if the national security is the, in the sense what I'm talking about when it comes to like an Illuminati, it's just how government has always been. And you can see that even with lockdowns, they want to inch their power farther and farther and farther. And it's just it's it's weird because if you relate it to the Kennedy assassination, a lot of people, the reason why it gets labeled a conspiracy to where you can't look into it is that no one could ever think that they could just assassinate someone like that or the government has the ability to but there's recorded parts of history that will show you that i mean the kennedy assassination lines it up perfectly there's a lot of stuff that you can raise questions about whether it's the chain of custody with the bullet or whether it's the autopsy and it leads to bigger issues and to think that that's not happening today still I mean, it, it, it's very easy to get the public to accept anything you're going to pass if you make them incredibly scared or incredibly on your side to support you. And I don't know why there would be a giant basis for – I mean, after the assassination, did you see any giant dramatic changes when it came to um, a public support? Did you see a lot of people backing Johnson and the fact of whatever he was going to establish? Absolutely. I mean, keep in mind that – at this point in 63, people have an overarching trust in government, and they, they really believe in the CIA. They believe in the Pentagon, and many of them still do today. And I would say most Americans, they, they treasure the, this institution, uh, and, but it was much more so in 63. So when Kennedy's assassinated, the thought that this could be a inside job, a national security job, did not occur to hardly anyone. I, I, if it occurred to anybody, I would say it's maybe three people in the entire United States. It, it just didn't. It didn't enter people's mind that that's a possibility that this would happen in America. Um, the 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 fact was that the the CIA adopted the uh, the power of assassination when it was formed. Uh, they, as far back as 52, they already had an assassination manual where they talked about the art of assassination, how to commit it, and most important, how to keep people from figuring out that it's a state-sponsored assassination by the CIA. But that manual isn't discovered till the 1990s. And, and 
so clearly, you know, they, they assassinate Lumumba in 61, but nobody really knows what's going on here with, with this assassination program. They have repeated assassination attempts against Castro. Um, and they, they clearly targeted uh, Acobo Arbenz, the president of Guatemala, with assassination. And they won't reveal their list of, of targeted assassinations, but clearly Arbenz had to be at the top. He was able to, to escape the country before they assassinated him. So people didn't think about this. I mean, it's natural. Why would you think the government would assassinate a president? People didn't know about this war that was taking place. This is, this is all stuff that, that was kept secret that came out mostly in the 1990s, 30 years after the assassination. But there were suspicions. Uh, there was a guy named Mark Lane, who was a New York lawyer that wrote a book called A Rush to Judgment that was on the New York Times bestseller list that raised questions about the assassination because there was weird stuff. You know, if it's a lone nut, why shroud all of the investigation into national security and secrecy? I mean, most of the Warren Commission hearings were in secret. Why? Well, what's that all about? The, the autopsy shrouded in secrecy. The, the autopsy personnel were required to sign secrecy oaths in which they were threatened with criminal prosecution or court martial if they ever talked about what they had seen. Uh, but all of this is kept secret. But uh, some people with critical minds are saying, what the heck is going on here? And then, uh, Kat, I mean, Oswald is assassinated within a couple of days, which had all the earmarks of, hey, this guy's not going to talk. And we're going to silence him and, like a hit. So people felt uneasy. And so within a year, they did public opinion polls. Nobody bought the, uh, the Warren Commission. Anybody? Well, I say not nobody. Most people didn't buy the Warren Commission. Uh, report that this was a lone nut assassination of the president. But I would say very few of them tied it in with the national security establishment. They didn't know. They Everybody believed that Oswald was, was one of the assassins. That was, that was the common denominator. So the debate became, and it still is today, as it's framed by the, the mainstream media, did Oswald act alone or did he act in conspiracy with other people? That, that was how it was always framed. And when I got into this, I, you know, I was trained as a lawyer. I, I practiced law for several years before I went into this kind of work. And so I have, a, I have that kind of analytical mind. And when I started analyzing this, I said, OK, uh, who would he have conspired with? And, and everything, every answer I came up with was a dead end. It made no sense. It made no sense. And for a legal mind, that just didn't work. So I, I needed to find a hypothesis where something made sense. And when I finally figured out that, hey, Oswald was a patsy, he was framed by the national security establishment, because you see, to frame a communist, as I point out in my new book, was an absolutely brilliant strategy. Brilliant, because everybody hated communists, everybody feared communists. So by, by framing a guy who was supposedly a communist, Nobody's going to come to his defense. Uh, the, the right wing's not going to come to his defense. They hated communists. But the left wing was scared to death to be smeared as a conspiracy theorist and a communist sympathizer. And I mean, you know, the, the fear after the Kennedy assassination was very, very palpable. So by framing a communist, making him a patsy, it, it's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant um, methodology here as far as this goes. Um, but gradually, as time went on, especially in the 1990s. That's when the, the dam broke loose. They, they had kept the whole thing in secrecy, pretty much. I'd say about 90% of it. In the 90s, when the ARRB comes into existence, primarily because of Oliver Stone's movie JFK, man, the dam breaks. And that's where the fraudulent autopsy comes in. And that's where the evidence establishes virtually conclusively that the autopsy that the military conducted, that's one undisputed fact in this, all this assassination. Nobody disputes the fact that it was the military that conducted the autopsy. That was a fraudulent autopsy. That's the, one of the great revelations of the ARRB, and we can go into the details of that if you like. But once that's established, for me as a lawyer, I'm saying, that's it. Case closed. And I point this out in my new book, An Encounter with Evil. Once you conclude that this was a fraudulent autopsy, you got nowhere to go. It's case closed because there's no innocent explanation for a fraudulent autopsy. 
Once you establish a fraudulent autopsy, that automatically means criminal culpability, especially when you when we find out what happened at Parkland Hospital with respect to the autopsy, um, right after Kennedy was declared dead, the autopsy is conducted within a few hours of the assassination. It had to be pre-planned. A fraudulent autopsy does not spontaneously come into existence. So once you conclude that the autopsy was fraudulent, that's in. You come in through the back door of the assassination and you think, you conclude naturally, this has to be criminal culpability because there's no innocent explanation for a fraudulent autopsy. Before we go into the fraudulent autopsy, like the specifics of it, because I, I have, when you walk through it, I'm probably going to ask some questions during it. But I, what do you, especially when we talk about uh, questions that I have right now, when it comes to, why do you think, do you just think people are accepting the fact that their government is doing this stuff, but they don't really care too much about it? Like how many things trend and then go away? How many things get exposed and then go away? You know, it just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And if we talk about Oswald being a patsy or we talk about the Warren Commission, for instance, there are so many videos of people that won't talk about specific questions or specific things at no point in an interview's career or an interviewee's career, do they just go, I don't want to answer that question. That shouldn't be a, a thing. If you're hitting something and you're coming honest and clean about a topic, you know, that's going to be discussed when it comes to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, or when it comes to Oswald or anything to do with the commission that you're involved with, that is searching into this, you would think that yeah, there's probably going to be a couple of questions are going to be asked. They're going to be really tough for you and put you on the spot. But they just go, no, I don't, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment on that. The amount of people that gave that answer is astounding, where I start going, this has to raise eyebrows and this has to get brought into question. But what it's been labeled as now is conspiracy. Now, the only thing that I can examine that would label it as a conspiracy is that people don't want to believe that their government has the power to just kill someone like that, especially the president. But I also think there's a lot of people out there that say a lot of crazy things like the earth is flat and the moon is not real and all this type of stuff that also happen to get their hand in this topic. And then they kind of create, create it up a little bit when the real evidence, just apart from whatever someone wants to put their perspective in on it. If you just look at the base evidence of the autopsy of just everything that's lining up, that's ending at, at a dead end, that doesn't make sense. The chain of custody with the bullet, you can really prove in cold, hard facts that there's something you need to question here, but it ends up getting hijacked by people that might want to, I don't know, go off on their own route with it. And it becomes an issue because right now, like the, you're, everything you just explained to me, it scares. It's scary. It's very scary. And I think at this point, this is where you need to worry because when people get scared, they tend to just let the government kind of take control. And I think that's a really, really big issue because they are up to things that you probably don't know about. And I think when it comes to this information, I mean, even if people start believing that, yeah, the government killed JFK, even with all the documents and all the stuff that end up getting released, hopefully later in the year, or later in 2024, whenever they're supposed to be released. If they find out that the government killed JFK, do you think that people will be better or worse off? I mean, it's going to shock a lot of people if it comes out to be true that you, everyone is Jim, everybody has been right for so long about this type of stuff. That's why there's so heavy denialism on the other side. You know, it's because maybe it's a safety issue. Maybe it's an unbelievable issue that the government could be like this. But I mean, if it's true, it's true. I'm in belief that it is true. But for a lot of people out there listening, they go, this is conspiracy talk. It's a, a heavy sign of denialism, which I think is a, is an issue as well, too. And the fact that it is being denied so much as a conspiracy when it's clearly there, I mean, it's a, it's a problem. Absolutely. And, and you hit the nail on the head with respect to fear. Um, people are afraid to confront this truth. It, it's a scary truth that the, that the national security branch of your government has this kind of power. Uh, and get away with it. I mean, they, they got away with it. Uh, they shrouded the whole thing in terms of secrecy. They kept the secrecy for at least 30 years on, on most of this stuff. And by that time, the national press has already fallen into line. They're not going to question it. Um, they succeeded. They got away with it. And that that's scary. And, and uh, you know, I can understand why somebody would say, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to think about it because this force of evil, which I talk about in my new book, An Encounter with Evil, is still here. 
Uh, that's a scary thought. It, it, now they have successors in it, but it's the system I'm talking about, the national security state system. That is a semi-permanent part of American life. Now it's not permanent. It could be changed. That's what I advocate. We ought to restore a limited government republic and get rid of this national security state. But if you look at what the, what the CIA and the Pentagon have been doing since the Kennedy assassination and even before, you know, they, 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 I told you they assassinated Patrice Lumumba, an entirely innocent man. They assassinated um, General Rene Schneider in Chile. This was a, the commanding general of the Chilean armed forces. He didn't do anything against the United States. What he did was he says, no, we're not going to have a coup here because our constitution doesn't provide for that. Uh, Allende, if we're going to oust him, has to be ousted in an election or through impeachment. The CIA orchestrates his assassination, his kidnapping where he's assassinated. So the, the CIA does assassinate people. And they do assassinate foreign leaders. They, they have regime change operations. But I, I think most people don't want to hear about those things. It's like it makes them uncomfortable. But it's a reality, Robbie. It's, we know that is reality. So the question is, what happens if a president of the United States ends up in the same position as a Patrice Lumumba, a Fidel Castro, a Arcobo Arbenz, a Allende, Saddam Hussein, whatever, that ends up from in, within our own government, they conclude is a threat to national security. Uh, my hunch is that there's a lot of Americans who say, if that president becomes a threat to national security, I want the national security establishment to oust him. Uh, and that's precisely what happens here. The national security establishment orchestrates an assassination brilliantly executed but you have to under you have to you have to understand that this is the nature of the operation the cia is specializing in assassination that's that's their specialty from the time they came into existence in 47 remember that assassination manual from 52 it emphasizes the importance of finding ways to assassinate foreign leaders where they can't trace it these guys are ivy league graduates so the, the scheme they put together, which I outline in detail in my new book, is brilliant. It's absolutely ingenious. And part of it involves framing uh, a, a person that, who is perceived to be a communist. Okay, So nobody comes to his assistance. But the other brilliant part of this thing was this fraudulent autopsy that they had to have orchestrated in advance. Um, let me just give you an example of... of, of what's going on here and the denialism that you're talking about. Right at the moment Kennedy is declared dead at Parkland Hospital, the Dallas County medical examiner, Dr. Earl Rose, proceeds to announce that he's gonna do the autopsy. This is not abnormal. This, this is required by state law. It was not a federal law to assassinate the president. There wasn't a federal law against assassinating a president. This was purely a state murder case at that time. And so state law requires the medical examiner in the, in the county where the, the murder takes place to conduct the autopsy. Now, what's an autopsy? Well, it's a, it's a forensic study of the body to determine how the president got killed. You know, where are the bullets? Removing bullet fragments. Where are the trajectories? Uh, the the, the autopsy is used in a criminal prosecution almost always. At that moment, a team of Secret Service agents goes into action and announces that they're not going to permit Rose to conduct this autopsy. Rose objects. He says, I have to do this. Texas law and these Secret Service agents say they're operating under orders, that they start screaming, yelling, they're brandishing guns. It's clear they're prepared to use deadly force against Rose or anybody else who gets in their way. And they start pushing this body out of Parkland Hospital, screaming, yelling. People said they were scared to death. Uh, and so they, they take the body, they take it to Love Field where Lyndon Johnson is preparing the Air Force One. He's having seats removed. So he's clearly the guy that issued the order, either directly or indirectly, because he's waiting for the body. He flies with the body to, to Maryland. He doesn't turn it to the hands of the local pathologists there in, in Maryland or Washington, D.C., the, the, that Washington DC area is filled with competent pathologists. He delivers it into the hands of the military. Now, why the military? This is not a military nation. The United States isn't at war. Kennedy hasn't been 
killed in the field of battle. This is a straight murder case committed supposedly by a civilian. Why does the military take control of this? Well, that's where the secrecy comes in. Military, the military is a culture of secrecy. You classify things. You pe- make, take, make people take vows of secrecy. And that's where you launch the frauds on autopsy. But do people ask any questions about this? No. No, it's like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And my position is, I want to know. In order to get this country back on the right track, what do we want in a country, Robbie? We want a country of peace and liberty and prosperity and harmony with the people of the world. We don't have that. And in order to get back on the right track, we need to confront the truth of this, the nature of this government. And part of confronting that truth is confronting that autopsy and what happened on November 22nd, 1963. Any therapist will tell you that, that you've got to confront the dark side of what's happening in order to get back to a position of health. When they were, um, when he, when they flew to Bethesda and the body was placed there and the military did the autopsy, when it comes back to the reports that they had, was it clear and definitive in the next couple of years or so that there was issues with the autopsy or when did there start to be notices that there was just a lot of fraud that was going on involved with it? Not just with, I mean, the way you just laid it out, if you just said it out loud, it just sounds nuts. Like where anybody would be like, okay, it's obviously clear, um, moving a body, for instance, especially one that didn't die. And you have the military military observe it when it didn't die in the field of battle it was a should have been just done by the pathologist or whoever that was there to do the autopsy but when it comes to the fraud issues did they start coming out later like how long was it a gap before people started noticing that the pictures weren't the same pictures that the photographer was supposed to take there was other views of it that didn't make sense and it was made with a different camera or different film and then you start looking at the weight of the brain i mean there was a lot of this stuff did that come out way later or did it come out like a couple of years later uh, some of it was was dribbling out, um, but if you take, for example, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, it, it's meeting in the 1970s, mid-1970s, and the reason it's meeting is because so many people are saying this makes no sense. The whole thing, the whole scenario, lone nut kills president and is snuffed out two days later. People had suspicions the overwhelming number of Americans, percentage of Americans had suspicions that something wasn't right here. So the House Select Committee says, we're going to reopen the assassination. So they, and they do that and they take depositions and so forth. During those hearings, things start to come out that cause even more people to wonder about what's going on. For example, um, some Navy enlisted men start talking now, they're released that they had been sworn to secrecy. Remember that, that I said they had to sign these secrecy oaths? That was, that was in November of 63 or maybe early December. Uh, so they hadn't talked. I mean, every military guy in the world knows what classified means. You don't talk. You go to the grave with it. He, I mean, you, you go to a, a, a veteran today in the Vietnam War and you say, do, do you have any classified information? He's going to say, even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Top secret. Yes, yeah, top secret. Well, so these guys had kept their secret, these Navy enlisted men, but they're released from the vow of poverty. Some of them start telling a very strange story. They say, now the official story is that Kennedy's body was brought into the morgue at 8 p.m. on the night of the assassination. That's the official story. And then, and, and, and is carried in with a, uh, an honor guard consistent of all members of the armed forces uh, the autopsy starts at 815. Okay, now these are undisputed facts that the body's brought in at 8, 815 uh, is when the autopsy starts. These Navy enlisted men start telling a very interesting story. They said, well, at 635 p.m., about an hour and a half earlier, we brought President Kennedy's body into the back entrance of the morgue secretly. That we, we met a, a big black hearse vehicle with men in suits got out. Uh, we, we offloaded this shipping casket, uh, not the big heavy ornate uh, casket that, that Kennedy had been placed into in, in uh, Dallas. Instead, just a plain little old shipping casket that you use to transport bodies on airplanes and so forth, that they carry that into the morgue at 6.35 p.m. Well, this obviously raises some questions. Are these guys lying? I mean, what would, what would be their motive? These enlist, they're Navy enlisted men. Um, well, so there's questions asked, and, and, and the, the guy that brings all this up 
is uh, an author named David Lifton in a book called Best Evidence, which I highly recommend. It, 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 it reads like a thriller. And, and Lifton brings up this notion of, well, maybe here there's a fraudulent autopsy going on. There's fraud taking place from that period of 635 to 8 p.m. when the body's reintroduced into the morgue in the official way. But then you have to go all the way to the 1990s, the Assassination Records Review Board, for the dam to break. Uh, for example, the ARRB discovers the existence of a woman named Sandra Spencer. Now, Spencer is a chief petty officer in the Navy. Uh, she works in the White House lab. Uh, she, her job is developing social photography for, for the White House. She works closely with the social photographer for the White House, a guy named Robert Knudsen. Uh, she works closely with the Kennedy family. Uh, so there, it would be impossible to find a more credible witness than Sandra Spencer. In, in fact, Jeremy Gunn, who served as general counsel to the ARRB, said that of all the witnesses the ARRB interviewed, there was nobody more credible than Sondra Spencer. Well, Sondra Spencer appears before the ARRB. This is 30 years later, more than 30 years later. and tells this remarkable story. She had kept her secret for 30 something years. She had been told it was classified what she was doing. So like a good military person, she had done that. Uh, she says, on the weekend of the assassination, she was asked to develop the official autopsy photographs for the Kennedy autopsy. And it was highly classified. She develops them. She looks at them while she's developing them. This is her job. And she tells the ARRB, uh, they show her the official autopsy photographs that are in the record today. And she looks at them and she says, no, Th those photographs that show the back of President Kennedy's head to be intact, right back here, those are not the photographs I developed. The photographs I developed showed a big, massive hole there. In other words, an exit wound there. Yeah. So now you've got a problem because you've got a witness, a highly credible witness who says, I saw the a photograph of President Kennedy's head with a massive hole. The official photographs in the autopsy, the ones we see today, show no hole. Something's going on. Either she's wrong and she's lying, or these photographs are fraudulent. This, this is how things start to break loose with respect to the frauds on an autopsy. Because if we go back to Dallas, we start dealing with the treating physicians. Let's take, for example, Robert McClellan, who I detail in my book, um, An Encounter with Evil. McClellan was steadfast for the rest of his life that when he walked into trauma room one, they were putting a tracheotomy on the president, helping him to breathe. They were putting a little breathing tube where there was a bullet hole there, which they called an entrance wound. McClellan goes to the head of the gurney to help with the tracheotomy and sees a massive hole in the back of President Kennedy's head. And he tells the other treating physicians, have you all seen this? And they said, no, we just got in here right before you did. We immediately started doing the tracheotomy to help him breathe. You need to come back and look at this. Now, why did he feel the need? And they all did. Why did he feel the need to do that, to stop this tracheotomy or delay it? Because he knew it was a fatal wound. There was no way they could save the life of the president. Nothing they could do. And so they might as well look at it and realize he's, he was dead on arrival. That wound matches what Sandra Spencer would talk about 30 years later in the photograph she witnessed. It wasn't just McClellan. As I detail in my new book, witness after witness after witness, Dr. Charles Crenshaw, Dr. Kim Clark, uh, Dr. Um, Perry, Nurse Diane Bora, Nurse Audrey Bell, Secret Service Agent Clint Hill, FBI Agents Francis O'Neill, uh, Jim Seibert, more stated that they saw this massive exercise wound in the back of President Kennedy's head. Well, everyone saw it with the film, not, not just in, even in the no. film, but... No, 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 no. Th this, this is the interesting part of the film, you see, and this is why I've written this book called An Encounter with Evil, the Abraham Zabruder Story. The f you see, when any anybody would say, especially after the 90s, but by this time, of course, there's indifference and there's fear. It's like, we don't want to know about this, Jacob. It, it's too long ago. It's 30 or 40 years ago. Why are you bringing this up? 
we don't want to hear about this. This is a conspiracy theory. Okay? Well, they could always point to the Zabruder film because the Zabruder film shows the back of President Kennedy's head to be intact after the, the fatal gunshot wound. What? Frame no. 313. I swear I see it. It's Half of it's gone when I see that bullet hit the side of his head. No, no, no. The, on frame 313, it shows an explosion on the side of his head. Right. Let me see. Yeah, the side of his right head. Okay. Now, the doctors at Bethesda said, I mean, at Parkland said, he had no damage to the side of his head. That this, this was all fine. The, the hole was back here. If you look at the frames following frame 313, there's a black patch there. The, the back of the head is fully intact. I'm talking about a hole right back here in the middle of the head. It's called the occipital region. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, so I'm thinking that he's got a hole in the side of his head, and you're telling me that the hole was actually in the back of the head. Exactly. And that explains why the guy in the interview said he was shot in the exactly. head. Exactly. And he points. And that, was, that, that is an exit wound because the amount of impact made the back explode. Not like it would pierce the front, but it would make the explosion in the back. That and that's the way bullets work. That when they enter the body, they enter as a little hole, but they're pushing mass in front of it. And so they, they blow out the other side with this mass that they're pushing. So the exit wound is always bigger. That's how in an autopsy, they can determine entrance wounds and exit wounds. The, the entrance wounds, the bullet size, the exit wounds, a blowout. So I'm, I'm reading this book last summer called 26 seconds that's written by the, the daughter of, of the, the granddaughter of Abraham Zabruder. Now, who's Abraham Zabruder? Dallas businessman, um, amateur home filmmaker. He, he's, he's not a professional filmmaker, but he's as good as they get in terms of amateur. And he knows he's been doing home movies for 30 years. He's got a top of the line Kodak movie camera. He goes out to Dealey Plaza to film the motorcade. He deeply admires the president. And he films the entire assassination. She writes this book, the granddaughter writes this book that makes some fascinating revelations that we, we can delve into. And, and these, these revelations, I decide because these revelations are so fascinating, I decide I'm going to write a book in response to her book. And that's my book, An Encounter with Evil. Um, but in any event, the people who are claiming the fraudulent autopsy run up against the Zabruder film because the Zabruder film shows this back head, what we call the occipital region, or maybe the occipital parietal region. That's where some of them said it was. But in any event, in the back of the head, and you can see all the, all the photographs online, uh, you can Google uh, this subject, and, and they're all putting the, the hole back here where Saunders Spencer saw it in that photograph. But the Zabruder film shows the back of the head to be intact. What does that mean? Well, that means either all of these witnesses are wrong, Robbie, that they're imagining a wound. And that's what the lone nut people say. Oh, all these people just imagined that wound under the stresses and strains of the assassination. They all independently imagined this wound. Or it means that the, the autopsy photographs that the military was in charge of are fraudulent. And it also necessarily has to mean that the Zabruder film is fraudulent. And that's the focus of my book. So with the witnesses of the people that were at Parkland that were able to explain this hole in the back of the head, um, were any of them Secret Service people? Not at Parkland. Uh, at, at Bethesda, you had, um, no, I'm not Secret Service, I'm, I'm thinking FBI agents. Sibbert and O'Neill were FBI agents. So no, none of them were Secret Service agents. No, I'm, I take that back. Clint Hill was a Secret Service agent. Clint Hill is the guy that runs to the back of the limousine and jumps on and pushes Jacqueline and Kennedy in, back into the seat. He then uses his body to cover up the president to protect him from any further shots from there to Parkland. And th during that, I don't know, five minute trip, I don't know, I forget how long it took. He is looking at this massive exercise hole in the back of President Kennedy's head. And he later states that he confirms that all these doctors said, yeah, I saw this massive hole in the back of Kennedy's head. He was Secret Service. Okay, because the reason why I bring that up is I'm not 
uh, disagreeing. I'm just saying this is a point that I usually bring up with like UAP and stuff like that as well, too. It's very hard with eyewitness encounters if you haven't experienced trauma because your memory, you start, to Im- you start to add things that aren't necessarily there. But it's very, very hard to do that with a whole group of people saying they saw one hole in the back of the head. That's just that it, it, that seems more real. But when I'm I mean, is it so you're saying that the, the Zapruder film how did someone edit that though to make it look like that there was a giant explosion in the side of the head because when I, the one thing i see with the zapruder film where i talk about that kennedy probably knew he was going to be assassinated was not i've heard people explain like you could tell that there was the system was mad at him or the government was mad at him or something like that but when you watch that film and he looks at the camera he doesn't look at it like waving still his face kind of changes like he looks at it like is this person what is that like he's trying to identify what this device is in this person's hand i see that too there's sometimes you see like in a video or something like that or the pope's waving to people or something like that he'll stop and look over at like cameras now we have iphones but you have these giant cameras that go on your shoulder it looks like something like you're going to get shot so he stops and he looks at it like this weird like way where like the mood kind of changes like he was trying to analyze if he was about to get shot or something like that and then he goes back to waving at people um what how, are you saying that they edited the film like there was this guy who makes home movies or something that had the capabilities to be able to fix that one slot i'm not disagreeing with you i'm just trying to understand here because this whole time i've been analyzing that i saw the zapruder film where he gets hit in the side of the head now you're telling me that there's this hole in the back of the head and the zapruder film was a hoax thing and this is like I, i'm trying to in real time process at all well of course because it, it's it's a complex subject it's a, it was a very highly sophisticated plot here uh but you would expect that the member these are ivy league graduates they they have to figure out a way to get this investigation shut down uh, and and they did that that's the other ingenious part of their of their plot and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll get to that later if you like but they succeeded in getting this investigation shut down immediately. Um, as of Monday morning, the Deputy Attorney General, Richard uh, Katzenbach, uh, he shuts down the investigation. He says, it's over. We've got to convince people that Oswald was an, uh, the only assassin. Well, that's impossible. You, you, there's no way you can determine who's involved in a, uh, in a plot to kill the president within two days. Uh, so it, it's a very sophisticated plot. And the, the point you raise is, is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's the natural point. How in the world are you going to alter a film? Uh, I mean, this is, this is you know, like, you know, going to the moon stuff, you know. Oh, you're going to alter the film to make it look like you didn't go to the moon or whatever. You know, that Capricorn won that famous movie. Uh, well, here's what happens. That, and this is, this is the subject of my book, An Encounter with Evil. Nobody could figure out how this could happen. The, the only way you can alter a film is, uh, at this point, is through Hollywood. They could do it. Um, you, they had the, the equipment to do that type of thing, special effects. You, but you need experts and you need equipment. There was no evidence at all that, that the film ever ended up in Hollywood. There was no evidence that Hollywood people came over to Chicago. Okay, now what's, what's Chicago have to do with this? Well, this takes us back to what happens to the Zabruder film. Zabruder knew immediately that he had something of value in his film and that he was going to get top dollar for it. And I detail this in my book. And she details it in her book too, uh, 26 Seconds by Alexander Zabruder, that he, he's going to get as much money as he can. So he gets the film developed. Uh, he gets it. He makes has three copies made of it. And he delivers uh, two copies to the Secret Service. They deliver one copy to the FBI. He retains the original. And so he meets with Life Magazine, a representative of Life Magazine, on Saturday morning, uh, the day after the assassination. And they negotiate and they strike a deal, which for the print rights are $50,000, which in today's dollars is around $330,000. Nice chunk of change here. Uh, And so he gives them the original film. That film is flown to Chicago. Now, why Chicago? Well, that's where Life Magazine's printing presses were, the, the printing company that puts together the magazine. So their, their plan is to print pictures of frames from the film in the next issue of Life Magazine. And they stopped the presses. They were already ready to go to press with the November 29 issue. It would come out on every Friday. 
And so one week after the November 22nd assassination, they stopped the presses in order to get these pictures in into the November 29th issue. Weirdly, in that issue, you they end up with black and white, muddy, difficult to decipher photographs from the film. This was a color film. Color was everything at this point. And Life Magazine specialized in color. So this, this is the official narrative, though, for years and years and years that what could have happened here to alter this film? And this is where the, the people that were claiming the lone nut theory had the best argument. They would say, no, the photographs from the autopsy have to be valid. All these people say what you, what you suggested. They've independently conjured up in their imagination these wounds, including these physicians that are charged with trying to save the president's life. They just imagine this wound. McClellan just imagines this wound because they have the Zabruder film that can say, well, see, how, how could you alter such a film? Well, lo and behold, the Assassination Records Review Board, this is now, we're talking about the late 1990s now. They kept this secret for some 40 years. The, the, the CIA kept, keeps the secret that they uncover a guy named Homer McMahon and they take his deposition, sworn testimony. Uh, McMahon is a very credible witness. He says, well, I was working for the CIA on that weekend and on Sunday night, I was summoned to uh, come down to the National Photographic Interpretation Center, which was owned and operated by the CIA, uh, where they delivered to me what was the Zabruder film. Now, it wasn't called the Zabruder film, but it, it was the Zabruder film. And my job was to do photograph and enlargements and post them on a briefing board. This is Sunday night after the assassination. All right, so... That raises some questions. Oh, and the Secret Service agent told McMahon that he had brought the film from a top secret CIA facility that nobody knew about all the way through the, the 90s called Hawkeye Works, which was located in, in Rochester, New York at Kodak's headquarters in the research and development section. But, well, this raises some questions like what's going on here? Oh, by the way, it's also a 16 millimeter film, which is critical, as I point out in my new book. Uh, why is that important? Well, if you go back to Dallas, uh, the film starts out in Zabruder's camera as a 16 millimeter film, but is converted into an eight millimeter film by slitting it down the middle. In other words, the, 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 the person taking the video, the film, he films on one side of the strip, he takes out the film, re-spools it after that one's filled. It fills the other side of the film. At the end of this process, you slid it down the middle. You connect the two ends end to end. It's now an eight millimeter film. Once you do the slitting, there ain't no putting back together. You cannot make an eight millimeter film into a 16 millimeter film again. They show up Sunday night with the 16 millimeters of Bruder film. Okay, so... This obviously raises some question, like what the heck's going on here? But there's missing pieces to this puzzle. It, it, it's still difficult to figure out what the puzzle is showing. The missing piece of the puzzle shows up 10 years later. Douglas Horn, who served on the Assassination Records Review Board, the author of the book I mentioned previously by FFF, JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, he and a guy named Peter Janney interview another CIA official named... Um, Dino Brugioni. Who is Dino Brugioni? According to Wikipedia, he is the world's most renowned expert on film interpretation. He works for the CIA, or at least at that time did. Uh, he's written a book on the Cuban Missile Crisis in which he participated. He's gotten awards out the gazoo for his work with, with, there's nobody that can interpret photographs and films better than Dino Brugioni. Brugioni tells Janney, who, uh, that he knew his dad. Janney's father was a high official in the CIA. Janney says, great, can I come and talk to you? He goes, yeah. In the process of these conversations, Janney, I mean, uh, Brugioni reveals that they brought him the Zabruder film on Saturday night at Nitpick, National Photographic Interpretation Center. And they ask him to do photo enlargements and it's an eight millimeter film here, okay? And they, he puts them on briefing boards and they take the film away. Now the, the pieces are coming together. 
the film doesn't doesn't end up in Life Magazine's uh, publishing printing plant. It goes to Chicago. It's diverted to Washington by plane. It arrives with Dino Brugioni at NITPAC on Saturday night. It's flown to Rochester where they make a copy of it. Now, Brugioni tells Janney and, and, um, and Horn that at Rochester, they could do anything. Like anything that Hollywood could do, they could do there. He said that they had the most unbelievable equipment. They had optical printers, which are copiers, that can make a copy that looks exactly like the original. And at that point, when you make, and I explain all this in my book, well, Horn has, I, I asked Horn to explain how this works. And so he contributed an entire chapter in my book, plus a section on how you, how an optical printer works. The optical printer copies the film, and then you can delete frames from it. And that's what they did. They deleted the frames wh where the back of the head is intact. They deleted the frames where the car stopped. There was 59 witnesses that said the car stopped or nearly stopped when the, uh, when, before the headshot comes in, uh, making it easier. And then you've got the turn onto Elm Street that's not there either. And Zabruder himself and his assistant said, we started filming when that turn took place. So you make an optical copy with deleted frames, and then you just paint in this section that you're talking about, about the side of the head. Now, Brugioni, here's the clincher. Brugioni is shown a copy of this, I mean, the extant Zabruder film, okay? Or not the original, but a copy that we all see online today. He had not seen this film for 30 years. He's watching this film, Robbie, that, that Horn is showing him. And I've got in my new book, an interview with him that's never been published before. First time published in my book. Brugioni looks at this film and says, no, 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 no. That is not the film I saw. The film I saw showed multiple frames on the headshot, not just one frame. And it showed blood and brain shooting up in the air. He says, that's what shocked us the most, is seeing this blood and, 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 and brain shooting straight up in the air, which matched what the witnesses had said that were in Dealey Plaza. The film shows no such thing. And time and after time, Brugioni is saying, no, sir, that is not the film I saw. So that's what happens. Now, the scheme was brilliant because, you see, they keep this secret for 40 years. And by this time, 40 years go by, Nobody cares. The mainstream press is too fearful. They're not going to get involved in this. That's where the secrecy in this plot turn out to their, be their benefit. Because by this time, some of us care. It's like, okay, now you've got a fraudulent photograph. Now you've got a fraudulent film. What are you going to do about it? And that's what we're asking. You know, this is something that needs to be confronted here. Because a guy like Brugioni, too credible. A guy like Homer McMahon, too credible. Now you've got the pieces of the puzzle all coming together, but 40 years later. When it's something this complex, I can now see why um, people don't want to know anymore, don't even want to look into it anymore, because it's honestly really scary to think that they have that much power or there's that much work. I mean, honestly, it just seems like a hassle to me hearing it all be laid out and all the complex things they have to do to cover their own ass over just one, not even a couple of minutes in a day, basically, that uh, this all unfolded. Um, and it's been lasting this long only because there's amount of evidence of people trying to get it out there, which puts a big weight on you guys and independent researchers. I just don't think they were expecting so many people to dive into this. I think they accepted everyone to accept the narrative and kind of go along with it. But I mean, is that the start when they start influencing media? I mean, we see that now, you know, every business influence onto whatever you want to say, if it's research studies, if it's media in general, I mean, is this is where it starts. If you can get a bunch of people to show a Zapruder film that you think is real, but it turns out to be a hoax. Next thing you know, you got a bunch of the public saying no, like I just did a minute ago where I saw the brain get hit and explode that way. There's a whole different thing to it. And this is all a lie. I mean, this it, it's very, very shocking. I'm just, you mentioned something earlier about the film being Kodak. Weren't the autopsy photos Kodak? Uh, there's controversy over that, and I'm not the guy to answer that. That when when John Stringer was John Stringer was the official autopsy photographer, and when the ARRB thirty years later asked him to identify the autopsy photographs, 
he said those some at least some of them uh, were not the photographs he took and I forget what his explanation was and how he knew that but it was something like they were either Kodak and he took Amscum or something like that frames from a different type of camera forget exactly what his explanation was uh, but he denied the authenticity at least of the brain photographs. Yeah, he didn't uh, take a vascular view, which is an up angle on the brain. Yeah, now let, let, let's go into the brain photographs because th the brain exams, because this, this goes to, the, to, to what you're talking about, about the, the autopsy photographs here and, and the real fraud that took place here. And th this is another you know, smoking gun, if you will, of the, of the autopsy. Well, that's what I told you off air is I couldn't explain how they say the weight of the brain is, say, 1,500, an average brain is 1,300. And if you see there's a Pruder film where it, there's a, a big chunk that comes out of the side, you, it wouldn't add more weight onto the brain if it's all splattered in the back seat of the vehicle, like you can see pictures of. And, you know, Mrs. Kennedy had it all over her dress, and there was a guy who was picking pieces of brain out of his teeth. If it's that, then it, the, the, the whole pictures of the brain, I was like, did they sew it back up? And people go, no, they didn't sew it back up. You don't do that. It's like, well, then how do they get a perfect picture of that? So it starts to raise in the question, did they have Kennedy's actual brain if it, they're trying to paint this narrative? The point you raise is absolutely valid. I mean, if you look at the uh, autopsy report, the official autopsy report, it says the brain weighed 1,500 grams. As you point out, the average size is 1,350, 1,300 in that range. Everybody everybody acknowledges that a major portion of the brain was blasted out, whether it's this exit hole back here, or whether you take the official narrative over here where the Dallas treating physician said there was no problem here. It doesn't matter. A massive part of the brain was blasted out. Dr. McClellan, who I mentioned earlier, he estimated it to be around a third. Um, so how does that, how does the brain then end up weighing more than the average size brain? It's impossible. I mean, there, you, right there, you've got evidence of fraud, but that's not the real evidence of fraud that, that took place here. Um, this, is, this is what happened. You've got a brain examination that takes place immediately after the assassination. You've got another brain examination that takes place about a week later, seven to 10 days later. The pathologist for the, for the autopsy always claimed that there was just one brain exam. So right there, you've got fraud. When, it, when, it, when people are lying and saying there's only one brain exam, when in fact there were two, right there, prima facie evidence of fraud. You know that there's criminal culpability here. Well, at the first brain exam, John Stringer, the photographer, was there, along with two of the, of the pathologists. So there's three of them. Stringer's taking pictures of the brain, which is standard. He states that what they did during the brain exam is they sectioned it. They, they, they cut it like a loaf of bread. That's standard. You would always do that with a gunshot to the head because you're looking at, at trajectories. And that's, that's how you determine trajectories. Uh, you, you cut it like a loaf of bread. Well, there's something important to note about this process that once you cut it like a loaf of bread, you can't put it back together. Well, the official brain photographs in, in the record that you were referring to show a fully intact brain. Now, it's a damaged brain, but it's fully intact. There's, it's not sectioned. That's how you know that it cannot possibly be the same brain as the first brain exam, which clearly was President Kennedy's brain. The second brain exam deals with a brain that was somebody else's brain. And that's the official photograph. Now, would it have been difficult to do that? Of course not. Bethesda was a teaching hospital, med medical center. They, they, they train doctors there. At, at training hospitals, they have spec brain specimens, heart specimens, organ specimens, because they're teaching people how to operate and so forth. So getting a substitute brain is not a problem. Well, the, at the second brain exam, they have the two same pathologists. They were clearly involved in the fraud but they don't have Stringer there. They have another photographer who's unnamed, uh, who took these pictures. The ARRB figures this out, Robbie. Uh, Douglas Horn was the guy that truly figured it out, and I detail that in my book. And he goes to the gen general counsel for the ARRB, Jeremy Gunn, and Gunn says, I agree with you. <laughs> this guy's the lawyer for the ARRB. There's two separate brain exams, and, and the second one 
necessarily has to be a brain that didn't belong to Kennedy. There you've got conclusive proof of autopsy fraud, which means criminal culpability. There's no way around it. Like I've said before, there's no innocent explanation for a fraudulent brain exam or fraudulent autopsy. The one thing I can't get over is the fact that if this is exactly like how you're saying, and it, it, to me, I, I believe it. Um, it's just for the general public, um, it's a it's a perfect storm of events because nobody's going to question or do this an uh, analyzation or want to ask questions about stuff when they hear this information because there was a large amount of pride in wanting to get back at another country for killing your president, which was the narrative that was being painted out there, which was causation for war. Um, I'm not, I'm not wrong in saying that. I mean, that's, this is what this whole thing has been. That's leading into kind of the idea of what all the wars that we've started and all this idea that, you know, we're trying to bring democracy in a sense, democracy has been hijacked. It's, it's not, it's not that it's about, we're going to war. And I, I think it's a power issue. I don't know what it is. It just really sucks. And it's kind of scary because you look at this aspect that the president was killed, you know, that's the person that we expect to be protected the most and it really brings into question of power of our own lives for instance are we as free as we think we are or is it just a sense of how free as they want us to be i mean it, even saying that people go that sounds like crazy talk it's like it's not crazy talk it's laid out right in front of you i mean there's things you should be able to question there's things you should be able to talk about but everything's kind of been silenced in a sense well, it has been silenced, and in large part, it's, it's because of what you raised earlier, the, the news media, uh, that the, the blackout on this started immediately. I mean, Lyndon Johnson, uh, there was investigations taking place of him with respect to official corruption, and Life Magazine was getting ready to publish an article in that November 29th issue on his official corruption. It was clear that Johnson stood a very good chance of getting indicted, and um, as soon as he's elevated to the presidency, he makes two calls to newspapers in Texas that were in conducting investigations, and he threatened them and said, you shut down those investigations. He threatened to sick the IRS on one of them and threatened to sick regulatory action on the other. And they immediately shut down those investigations, both newspapers. And over time, year after year, decade after decade, it's clear that the Pentagon and the CIA do not want this discussed in the mainstream media for obvious reasons. Uh, and they make it clear that they disapprove. Well, over a period of time, everybody knows their power. It's, it's enormous power, it's omnipotent power. Nobody wants to jack with them. So by the time this starts coming out 40 years later, there's not a newspaper in the land that wants to deal with it because they know that the Pentagon disapproves. They know the CIA disapproves. And early on, the CIA sent out a, a missive, a, a message to their assets in the mainstream press with this notion of a conspiracy theory. That as a strategical thing, they said people are starting to suggest that the CIA was behind this. A strategy to use is to smear them with the label conspiracy theorist. And that's how that comes into existence as part of this whole controversy. And there's a real fear of being labeled a conspiracy theorist. I, I've seen it in the libertarian movement where libertarians, man, it's just like the notion of being labeled a conspiracy theorist is the worst thing in the world. They don't want to look at this. They don't want to examine it. They don't want to criticize the Pentagon and the CIA. Well, for me, I, I, you can label me whatever you want. All that matters to me is what's the truth here? And, and to bury the truth and to say, oh, well, we can move on. It's a long time ago. It's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. We have to deal with this, Robbie. It's a rupture in American history, a major rupture, one that, in, that altered the, the, the future course of America. If Kennedy's vision had prevailed, if he had won, uh, we wouldn't have all this national security establishment, 9-11, the, 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 the continuation of the Cold War, the extreme anti-Russia animus that continues to drive the country, the embargo against Cuba. Why an embargo against Cuba? All the sanctions, the embargoes, all the crises, North Korea, Vietnam, uh, the, the Cold War, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen. It's, it's perpetual. It's perpetual war now, perpetual crises. If Kennedy's vision had prevailed, 
none of that would have taken place. He was moving America in a totally different direction, a direction that really would have made the national security establishment irrelevant. And, and so not only do they have to take him out because they consider him a threat to national security, because they're convinced that his policies of what they considered appeasement, of cowardice, in the face of this overarching communist threat, were going to result in a communist takeover of the United States. Uh, he left in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He leaves Cuba in communist hands. That was like anathema to the president, to the Pentagon and the CIA. And now he's making nice with the communists. Uh, so not only was he placed in America in the position of falling to the communists, he's also threatening the existence of the entire national security establishment. Because if he's right and he moves America in this totally different direction for the next five years of his presidency, the national security state, the Pentagon, the CIA become irrelevant. We don't need them anymore. And they understood that very clearly. Instead, they get rid of him in their minds, they're not doing something evil. I point this book uh, out in my book, An Encounter with Evil. They're doing something what they're, they're intended to do. That's why they, they assassinate Lumumba. That's why they go after Allende. That's why after they go after Arbonne. In their minds, their job is to protect America from the communist threat. That's what they're doing. And when you've got a president who is, doesn't understand that, who's, who's a neophyte, who's naive, whose policies are leading to a communist takeover, that's an even graver threat than Allende, than Arbenz, than the Lumumba, Mossadegh in, in Iran in 53, who they also ousted. That's their duty. In their minds, they're acting patriotically. They're not acting evil. In, in, in their minds, they're doing something good. They're, they're saving the country from a communist takeover. But look at where we end up. And this is why I keep, I, I emphasize in my new book, Americans need to confront the past and confront where we are today. And if you like where we are today, just continue doing, you know, supporting what's going on here. Uh, we're very close to a nuclear war with Russia right now through this reckless policy that they've adopted with Ukraine. And um, but if you like it, great. What I'm saying is, is there's a way out of this. But getting out of this, you've got to confront the past and you got to confront how we got to where we are today. And a necessary part of that is examining what Kennedy stood for, what he was trying to do, the direction he was leading America, and why he was assassinated. I, uh, I think that's a perfect thing to end on. I'm gonna have to, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna do a JFK conference with a couple of other people as well, too. All of us in one podcast, kind of discussing the issues. I, because I, I think a main impact is that a lot of it's affecting us today. But I appreciate you for giving me your time and talking about the subject. Um, is there a place where people can find any of your books? Do you want to rattle off some links? Do you have a Twitter? Uh, yeah, um, we've got. I've got on my own Twitter, and then we, but the main Twitter is FFF. Um, and but the best thing to do is go to FFF.org. I mean, that's where we have 32 years of articles on the Kennedy assassination, but along with a lot of other uh, libertarian issues, especially with respect to foreign policy. Uh, but there's a section there with all our books, including all the books on JFK. Uh, we've done some great conferences. We did a conference last spring, a year ago with some of the names you mentioned, Gary Aguilar, Doug Horn, uh, David Mantic, uh, Jim um, DeEugenio. Uh, we've had Oliver Stone speak at two of our conferences. Uh, th this is a big issue for us. And, and I think you get a sense of why it's, it's important to us in this, in this interview. And then this new book I've got, I would highly recommend, An Encounter with Evil, the, the Abraham Zabruder story, because it doesn't just examine the Zabruder film, it examines where we are as a country, how we got here, what we need to do to get out of this thing. And uh, that's the book that I would recommend everybody to start with. Now, my, our best-selling book is The Kennedy Autopsy, uh, but I cover the autopsy in my new book, but for a more detailed uh presentation, I would also recommend people get that book. For motive to understand the Cold War context of this, I'd recommend Doug Horn's book, JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, to examine that war, to understand what it was going on, what was going on with it. Uh, but everything starts at FFF.org, and that's where I'd recommend people go to. And I'll link it all in the description. I got some reading to do. I got some books to check out. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next